We'd like to see this de-escalated. We are not looking for some major confrontation. Undoubtedly, that's what everyone would like to see. You don't want to solve the problems such as we see in Ukraine at the point of a gun. You don't want to see it descend into full-out war. Will diplomacy work? Lubomir Lashuk joins me from Queen's University. Welcome, sir. Thank you for having me on. Is diplomacy something we can realistically hope will, in fact, bring a satisfactory conclusion? When one certainly hopes so, and obviously... Our Prime Minister and Mr. Obama and the leadership of NATO have begun making exactly the right kinds of statements, the right kinds of decisions to pressure Mr. Putin and the Russian Federation to withdraw from their illegal and unconscionable invasion of Ukrainian territory. Uh, whether it will be enough remains to be seen. Uh, the Ukrainian side has shown great, great restraint in the face of what boils down to armed aggression. Uh, so far, there have been no incidents that I'm aware of. Uh, the real issue now is, will Mr. Putin accept this defeat? And it is a defeat. Uh, at this point, it seems very likely that he can't move much further without risking uh, a serious confrontation. Uh, of course, NATO is technically, at least according to treaties, uh, committed to the territorial integrity, political independence, and sovereignty of Ukraine. That's already been violated. Uh, whether Mr. Putin will move back and uh, try to resolve the issues between Ukraine and the Russian Federation through diplomatic means remains to be seen. It's, it's an open question right now, frankly. Well, certainly, I guess there are still nonviolent things that can be tried, more in terms of sanctions, removal from the G8. Do those kinds of things have a strong impact to a guy like Putin, do you think? Yes, I think they do. I mean, money, money talks. Uh, I think it's very important that Canada and other countries press for the removal of the Russian Federation from the G8 at this point. Withdrawing an ambassador for consultations was important. I think there have to be economic sanctions imposed to some degree, reparations paid to the government of Ukraine for the damage that's been done. Uh, I think it's very clear that the, the Russian fleet that's based in Sevastopol has a right to be there according to leases signed between the two governments. There's no problem with that. When I was in Crimea, uh, there were no tensions between Russians, Ukrainians, and Crimean Tatars other than the sort of normal societal ones. Uh, Russians are certainly a, minor, a majority in Crimea because they are, of course, they were a colonial power, an imperial power, and a lot of people, a lot of ex uh, Soviet apparatchiks and nomenclatura settled there, and that's not surprising. It's a wonderful place. Uh, but the indigenous population, the Crimean Tatars, are clearly pro-Ukrainian, and so is the Ukrainian population and the Ukrainian military forces that are there that have, as I say, behaved very well. Um, this has to be resolved because the only alternative is a military confrontation. One looks at the Russian Federation and says, wow, a colossus against you know, uh, Goliath against David in Ukraine. Yeah. But you have to keep in mind that the Russian Federation is itself a multilingual, multinational society. There are over 80 different nationalities within the Russian Federation, many of them aching to be autonomous, if not independent. Think of the Chechens, for example, the Karelians, uh, various other, the Tatars. Uh, these people are all champing at the bit. So Mr. Putin's uh, aggression against Ukraine, his attempt to sort of say, well, I'm stepping in for humanitarian reasons to help a beleaguered minority, could backfire very seriously against him. And I don't think most Russians want that. I think most Russians of, of the younger generations simply want to live like Europeans. The great tragedy of this is not just for Ukraine, but for those Uk Russians who believe in democracy, who believe in a civil society, the rule of law, who are against oligarchs, who are against corruption those young Russians, that generation, is going to be damaged seriously by what Mr. Putin has done. It's, it has destroyed the reputation of Russia as a reasonable power, or as a reasonable state in, in world affairs. This is the 21st century, not the 19th. And yeah. he's behaved like a, a Tsar, and that's, uh, that hasn't gone down very well. Well, it's encouraging to hear you say that that's not what the young people of Russia want. I mean, we keep hoping ever since that uh, wall went down in Berlin that uh, it will become a different country. And I guess you have a population coming up that wants it to be a different country. And Putin, as much as we may have hoped for different if we did, uh, still clings to the old way. He'd like he's, to be he's the, part of the He's part of the old guard. And I think, yeah. I think your listeners have to sort of, your viewers have to sort of think of that biblical story about Moses leading his people out of Egyptian bondage and captivity. 
It took them 40 years to reach the promised land. Why did it take them so long? Because the people that were born in captivity couldn't get into the promised land. Even Moses himself could only look down from the mountain and see that the next generation had gotten there. It took 40 years for that old way of thinking uh, to die out, literally. And that's what's happening. Uh, we saw the Orange Revolution, which was a very positive development, but it collapsed. We've seen this revolution, which I predicted sometime back in early November, January would happen. I suggested that we might come very close to war, and we have done that now. I think it's still a long way before Ukraine will be truly free, but I sincerely hope that when Ukraine becomes free and reestablishes, reemerges its position in Europe where it belongs, so will Russia. Well, it's interesting the way you just worded that. You said when they become free. So you believe that ultimately that's where we're headed? Oh, I think there is no doubt that Ukraine was in Europe, is in Europe, and will return to Europe, whether you, Ukraine returns to Europe today, tomorrow, or in the next for, you know, few years. That's a different question. I think the drag is Russia. And unfortunately, for some reason, the old guard in Russia still seems to think that they can recobble some kind of Eurasian customs union or imperial state in between Asia and Europe. It's a very strange uh, notion. I mean, Mr. Putin really should be reminded of the old, uh, you know, uh, nursery rhyme, Humpty Dumpty fell off a wall and all the king's horses and all the king's men couldn't put Humpty together again. That's what's happened to the Soviet Union. He called the collapse of the Soviet Union the greatest geopolitical catastrophe of the 20th century. Are you kidding? It was, <laughs> it was, a, it was the greatest liberating moment, as we all remember, 1989, yep. the Berlin Wall coming down, then the euphoria when the Soviet Union collapsed and, and did so relatively un, without too much violence. That's right. Um, we all looked forward to a better world, and so did many, many Russians, the liberal right. opposition, the Democrats, and so of many Ukrainians. And that's the way it's going. It's inevitable. Whether it happens soon or a little bit later, it's inevitable. I really appreciate it. Thanks so much. My pleasure.